South African Commercial Catering and Allied Workers Union. This is page 134 of the study guide. Versus Irvin and Johnson, INJ Limited. The Constitutional Court, in dealing with the recusal of a judicial officer on grounds of bias, confirmed the correctness of the test adopted by the Supreme Court of Appeal. However, the Constitutional Court preferred to use the phrase a reasonable apprehension of bias rather than a reasonable suspicion of bias due to the inappropriate connotations which might flow from the use of the word suspicion in this context. Therefore, one is not required to show that there was in fact no bias or partiality in the process. The criterion is that no reasonable person would have had a perception of suspicion slash apprehension of bias. Repeat, the criterion is that no reasonable person would have had a perception of suspicion slash apprehension of bias. In other words, the affected individual merely has to prove an appearance of bias or partiality rather than the existence of actual bias. In other words, the affected individual merely has to prove an appearance of bias or partiality rather than the existence of actual bias. We will elaborate on the question of bias and its application with the PAJA when we examine the grounds of review in study unit 12. Members of page 135 of the study guide, administrative law, the constitutional right to procedurally fair administrative action. The constitutional right to procedurally fair administrative action. Some general observations. Both the interim and the 1996 constitutions expressly guarantee the right to procedurally fair administrative action. We could therefore say that both these provisions constitutionally entrench the rules of natural justice so that the rules of natural justice are no longer only common law rules, but now have a constitutional basis. To refresh your memory, we repeat these two sections. Section 24B of the Interim Constitution stated, Every person has the right to procedurally fair administrative action where any of their rights or legitimate expectations is affected or threatened. Section 33.1 of the const of the nineteen ninety six constitution says everyone has the right to administrative action that is lawful, reasonable and f- procedurally fair. Everybody has the right to administrative action before the commencement of the interim constitution, the rules of natural justice could be excluded by statute. Although our courts were generally reluctant to infer an intention to exclude them in the absence of an express provision in this effect. Does this mean that the right to procedural fairness may never be lifted? Does this mean that the right to procedural fairness may never be lifted? We have already explained that no right is absolute and may be limited provided the criteria laid down in section 36 of the Constitution, the limitation clause has been met. However, given the injustices in the past, we may safely say that there will be very few instances that will justify any exclusion or limitation of this right. Section 
In other words, legislation may exempt administrative functionaries and institutions from complying with the entrenched rules of natural justice. Only if these exemptions comply with a limitation clause in the Bill of Rights. Incidentally, the PAJA itself provides for a limitation to the right to procedural fairness. Repeat, the PAJA itself provides for a limitation to the procedural, the right to procedural fairness, provided certain conditions are met. We will return to this aspect below. The content of the right to procedurally fair administrative action. It is important to note that the procedural fairness should be regarded as a codification of pre-constitutional law or to be confined to the principles of natural justice. To codify means that legal rules have been recorded in a comprehensive code or law book which serves as the primary source of a particular body of legal rules. In essence, such a view will negate the truth that fairness is a flexible concept depending on the circumstances of each case. See below when we discuss the PAJA contents pertaining to procedural fairness in detail. In Van Heysteen, N.O. versus Minister of Environmental Affairs and Tourism. Even it said, even if Section 24B is to be regarded as merely codifying the previous law on the point, a party entitled to procedural fairness under the paragraph is entitled to appropriate cases to more than just the application of the Audi Alterum Partem and Nemo Iodex in Sauer Causa Rules. What he is entitled to is, in my view, the principles and procedures which, in the particular situation or certain circumstances, are right and just and fair. Thus, the constitutional right to procedural fairness is more comprehensive than the rules of natural justice and may encompass aspects of fair procedure not yet covered in by the com- by the common law repeat thus the constitutional right to procedural fairness of the interim constitution and section 331 of the 1996 constitution is more comprehensive than the rules of natural justice and may encompass aspects of fair procedure not yet covered by the common law. Having said all of this, we must point out that in order to determine the content of the constitution, constitutionally protected right, we have to look into these common law rules of natural justice as developed and applied by the courts to give flesh and meaning. Repeat, we have to look into these common law rules of natural justice as developed and applied by the courts to give flesh and meaning to the constitutional right. To give flesh and meaning to the constitutional right. In other words... The content of the common law rules gives a good indication of the content of the constitutional right. In other words, the content of the common law rules gives a good indication of the content of the constitutional right. In other words, the content of the common law rules, the content of the common law rules gives good indication of the content of the constitutional right. The constitutional right is not confined to the rules of common law. The constitutional right is not confined to the rules of common law. The 9.4.2 on page 136, the court's interpretation of the constitutional right to 
procedural fairness before the PAJA. The court's interpretation of the constitutional right to procedural fairness before the PAJA. In Courts of Versus Minister of Health, for the facts of this case, see Study Unit 8, the court found that the Director General's consideration of information that did not form part of the application amounted to a denial of procedurally fair administrative action. Repeat, in Kotze versus Minister of Health, the court found that the Director's general consideration of information did not form part of the application and amounted to a denial of procedurally fair administrative action. Did not form part of the application and amounted to a denial of procedurally fair administrative action. The applicant should have been an, given an opportunity to deal with other information. The applicant should have been given an opportunity to deal with other information that did not form part of his application, which was taken into account when considering it. The applicant should have been given an opportunity to deal with any other information that did not form part of his application, and which was taken into account when considering it. The applicant should have been given an opportunity to deal with any other information that did not form part of his application and which was taken into account when considering it. Denying a hearing to a person who is entitled to the benefit of a hearing, of a fair hearing, denying a hearing to a person who is entitled to the benefit of a fair hearing, which is a fair procedure, is a fatal irregularity. Denying a person who is entitled to the benefit of a fair hearing, um, it, denying a person who is entitled to the benefit of a fa- of a fair hearing is a fatal irregularity, irrespective of the strength of the case against such a person. In other words, where a fair procedure has been prescribed, it has to be followed regardless of the possible effect of the outcome of the decision. Repeat. In other words, where a fair procedure has been prescribed, it is to be followed regardless of its possible effect on the outcome of the decision. This was illustrated in Fraser versus Children's Court, Pretoria North. Repeat, in other words, where a fair procedure has been prescribed, it has to be followed regardless of of the possible effect on the outcome of the decision. This was illustrated in Fraser versus Children's Court. The applicant was the father of a child born out of wedlock. The mother who had decided to put the child up for adoption said her decision was based on the applicant's initial refusal to marry her. Her inability to raise the child as a single parent and her belief that the applicant should not have access rights to the child because he exhibited traits that would render access undesirable. Adoption proceedings proceedings were initiated and the applicant attempted to have the proposed adoption set aside. The applicant sought to have the adoption proceedings stayed and also instituted counter-adoption proceedings. The commissioner finally decided the matter without hearing oral evidence and awarded the child to the adoptive parents 
holding that it served the interests of the child best to leave him with the adopted parents. Repeat, the commissioner finally decided the matter without hearing oral evidence and awarded the child to the adoptive parents, holding that it served the interests of the child to leave him with the adoptive parents. The applicant, the applicant then instituted review procedures aimed at the setting aside of the adoption order. The applicant then instituted review procedures aimed at the setting aside of the adoption order. One of the grounds for the review was that the applicant as a parent one of the grounds for review was that the applicant as a parent within the meaning of the Child Care Act 74 of 1983 was entitled to be heard on the adoption. One of the grounds for review was that the applicant as a parent within the meaning of the Child Care Act 1983 was entitled to be heard on the issue of adoption. To sum up in regard to prayer 3, namely the review of the adoption order, I find that the applicant sought to have his claim for adoption decided by viva voce evidence to which I am satisfied he was entitled. The commissioner's judgment frustrated the applicant's attempt and the circumstances amounted to such prejudice as to constitute gross irregularity. In short, he was not afforded a proper hearing on his claim for the adoption of his son. In, Jan in Janse van Rensburg, N.O., Minister of Trade and Industry, the constitutionality of two provisions of the Consumer Affairs Unfair Business Practices Act 71 of 1988 was at issue. Section 7.3 authorizes investigation officers appointed by the Consumer Affairs Committee to conduct Section 7.3 authorizes investigation officers appointed by Consumer Affairs Committee to conduct searches and seizures for the purpose of ensuring the terms of the act are being observed or to adopt information relevant to an investigation launched by the committee. Section 8.5 makes provision for the Minister of Trade and Industry on the recommendation of the committee to take steps to prevent the continuation of business practices which are the subject of an investigation at a stage when the investigation is not yet been completed and to attach and freeze assets. DL 2601, page 137 of the study guide. In Janse van Rensburg, verse Minister of Trade and Industry, the constitutionality of two provisions 7.3 and 8.5a respectively of the Consumer Affairs, which is biz unfair business practices, Act 71, 1988, was at issue. Section 7.3 authorizes investigation officers appointed by the Consumer Affairs Committee to conduct searches and seizures for the purpose of ensuring that the terms of the Act are being observed or to be or to obtain information relevant to an investigation launched by the committee. Section 8.5 makes provision for the Minister of Trade and Industry on the recommendation of the committee to take steps to prevent the continuation of business practices which are the subject of an investigation at a stage when the investigation has not yet been completed and to attach and freeze assets. Section 
makes provision for the Minister of Trade and Industry on the recommendation of the committee to take steps to prevent the continuation of business practices which are the subject of an investigation at a stage when the investigation has not yet been completed and to attach and freeze assets. The court held that Section 8.5 violated the Administrative Justice Guarantee of Section 33.1. Section 8.5 was designed to protect the public by giving the Minister the power to stay business practices and to attach assets to prohibit their being dealt with. Repeat, Section 8.5 was designed to protect the public by giving the Minister the power to stay business practices and to attach assets to prohibit their being dealt with. These powers ensure that during the period of investigation, persons subject to the investigation would be prevented from continually from continuing the allegedly unfair practices and hiding or alienating assets in order to defeat prospective claims by members of the public. To achieve its object, the procedure had necessarily to be urgent and incisive. So these powers ensured that the period of investigation that during the period of investigation, the person subject to the investigation would be prevented from continuing the allegedly unfair practices and hiding or alienating assets in order to defeat prospective claims by members of the public. To achieve its object, the procedure had necessarily to be urgent and incisive. However, An examination of the powers of the minister shows that they were sweeping and drastic. For example, the minister was empowered to stay a business practice and attach or freeze assets merely by giving notice of the decision to do so. Thus, the actions could be taken without prior warning to persons affected by them. What is more, no sufficient guidance for the exercise of these wide powers had been given by the legislature. Moreover, irreparable harm might follow upon an exercise of these powers, which harm could not be averted by an appeal to a special court. Repeat, more over, irreparable harm might follow upon an exercise of these powers, which harm could not be averted by an appeal to a special court. These powers had to be weighed against the requirements for administrative justice. However, an examination of the powers of the minister shows that they were sweeping and drastic. For example, the minister was empowered to stay a business practice and attach or freeze assets merely by giving notice of the decision to them to do so. Thus, the actions could be taken without prior warning to persons affected by them. What is more? No sufficient guidance for the exercise of these powers was given by the legislature. Moreover, irreparable harm might follow upon an exercise of these powers. Moreover, irreparable harm might follow upon an exercise of these powers, which harm could not be averted by an appeal to a special court.
these powers had to be weighed against the requirements for administrative justice. The application of procedural fairness had to be considered with regard to the circumstances of each case. The court per Judge Goldstone held that in modern states it had become more and more common to grant far-reaching powers to administrative functionaries. The safeguards provided by the rules of procedural fairness are thus all the more important and are affected by the Bill of Rights. Observance of the rules of procedural fairness ensures that an administrative functionary has an open mind and a complete picture of the facts and circumstances with which the administrative action is to be taken. In that way, the functionary is more likely to apply his or her mind to the matter in a fair and regular manner. Therefore, the court held that the constitutional obligation rests on the legislature to promote and fulfill the entrenched fundamental rights, which means that where a wide discretion is conferred upon a functionary, guidance should be provided as to the manner in which those powers are to be exercised. Therefore, the court held that a constitutional obligation rests on the legislature to promote and protect and fulfill the entrenched fundamental rights, which means that where a wide discretion is conferred upon a functionary, guidance should be provided as to the manner in which those powers are to be exercised. In this, the absence of such guidance left the procedure provided for in Section 85A unfair and a violation of the administrative justice guarantee in Section 33.1. The court therefore declared the provision constitutionally invalid. <coughs> Repeat. Therefore, the court held that a constitutional obligation rests on the legislature to promote, protect, and fulfill the entrenched fundamental rights, which means that there were a wide discretion, that where a wide discretion is conferred upon a functionary, guidance should be provided so to the manner in which the, those, fun, those powers are to be exercised. In this case, the absence of such guidance left the procedure provided for in Section 85A unfair and a violation of the Administrative Justice Guarantee of Section 33.1. The Court, therefore, declared the provision constitutionally invalid. PAJA and the right to procedurally fair administrative action. You have encountered references to PAJA already. Return to the earlier study units where we discuss the historical background to PAJA. The requirements for action to qualify as administrative action. And so on to refresh your memory. We will discuss the PAJA and the right to procedurally fair administrative action in the following paragraphs. We will discuss the PAJA and the right to procedurally fair administrative action in the following paragraphs. 9.5.1 This is on page 138 of the study guide. Legitimate expectation Its development at common law and its recognition in section 3.1 of 
the PAJA. Legitimate expectation is development at common law and recognition of 3.1 of the PAJA. Point 1. Legitimate expectation and its development at common law. Point 2. Decisions dealing with legitimate expectation after 1994. 9.5.2. Section 3 of PAJA and the application of procedural fairness. 9.5.3. Section 4 of the PAJA and the application of procedural fairness. Decisions affecting the public. When will any administrative procedure be fair? For an answer, we need to turn to the PAJA itself and the requirements it sets for procedural fairness. We need to distinguish between the, pres- the provisions of Section 3 and 4, respectively. Section 3 deals with procedurally fair administrative actions affecting any person. Administrative action which materially and adversely affects the rights or legitimate expectations of any person must be procedurally fair. Administrative action which materially and adversely affects the rights or legitimate expectations of any person must be procedurally fair. Administrative action which materially and adversely affects the rights or legitimate expectations of any person must be procedurally This section applies to the administrative law relationships See Study Unit 4 where the individual administrative law relationships is discussed and study it carefully again. Study Section 4, however, takes care of administrative action affecting the public. This section therefore applies to general administrative law relationship and provides for situations where the rights of the public are affected by administrative action. Repeat, this section applies to the general administrative law relationship and provides for situations where the rights of the public are affected by administrative action. Upon reading subsection 1 of section 3, we notice that the words legitimate expectations have been added. This corresponds to the wording of section 24b of the interim constitution which required that the application of procedural fairness were affected or threatened. However, in section 33.1, of the 1996 Constitution, we found no reference to legitimate expectations, and nowhere else in PAJA do we find any reference to the legitimate expectations either. Repeat, however, in Section 33.1 of the 1996 Constitution, we find no reference to the legitimate expectations and nowhere else in PAJA do we find any reference to legitimate expectations either. And we definitely do not encounter any definition of or reference to legitimate expectations in Section 1 of PAJA. O'Regan ADCJ highlighted this contradiction in Wailele v. City of Cape Town 2008 and offered a solution to the problem as follows. A straightforward reading of these two provisions, which contains the definition administrative action and section 3.1, which gives effect to the right entrenched in section 33.1, 
one produces the enigma that administrative action is as defined not action which affects legitimate expectations. Yet, section 3.1 suggests that there is administrative action which will affect legitimate expectations and which must accordingly be procedurally fair. Repeat. The straightforward reading of these two provisions that is section 1 which contains the de- definition of administrative law uh, administrative action and also section 31 which gives effect to the right entrenched in section 331 which produces the enigma that administrative action is as defined not action which affects legitimate expectations. Yet, Section 3.1 suggests that there is administrative action that will affect legitimate expectations, which must accordingly be procedurally fair. In this case, a more general provision, the definition is in conflict with a specific provision, which is section 3.1. The specific provision is aimed at giving direct effect to the constitutional right to administrative action that is procedurally fair. The specific provision is aimed at giving direct effect to the constitutional right that is proce- that to the constitution constitutional right to administrative action that is procedurally fair. The apparent contradiction between the two provisions should be resolved by giving effect to the clear language of Section 3.1, which expressly states that administrative action which affects legitimate expectations must be procedurally fair. Repeat. The apparent contradiction between the two provisions should be resolved by giving effect to the clear language of Section 3.1, which expressly states the administrative action which gives effect to legitimate expectations must be procedurally fair. Thus, the narrow definition of administrative action in Section 1 must be read to be impliedly supplemented for the purposes of Section 3.1 by the express language of Section 3.1. Repeat, the narrow definition of administrative action in Section 3.1 must be... Not all authors are in agreement with this solution. Moreover, a number of academics offer different solutions to the contradictions highlighted by O'Regan ADCJ. We will not examine these arguments or offer any further comments on the contradiction. Suffice to say that Section 3.1 recognizes the doctrine of legitimate expectations and an examination of the doctrine of legitimate expectation is therefore called for. Hence the question, what are legitimate expectations? Legitimate expectation, its development at common law, and its recognition in section 3.1 of PAJA. By way of introduction, it must be noted that the recognition of legitimate expectations is in line with our case law. After 1994, for example, the court held in Jenkins v. Government of the Republic of South Africa. Legitimate expectation, its development at common law and its recognition in Section 3.1 of PAJA. By way of of introduction, it must be noted that 
the recognition of legitimate expectations is in line with our case law. After 1994, for example, the court held in Jenkins v. Government of the Republic of South Africa that the doctrine of legitimate expectation had become part of our common law, even though no reference is made to it in Section 33 of the 1996 Constitution. Earlier, the courts insisted that before the rules of natural justice could be, could be raised by an individual, he or she had... It is obvious that this insistence on existing, existing rights produced unfair results. Legitimate expectation and its development at common law. The doctrine of legitimate expectation was developed by British courts in a process of imposing upon administrative decision makers a general duty to act fairly. The application of the principle means that the application of the rules of natural justice is extended to cases where the affected party has no vested right, but does have a potential right or legitimate expectation. Repeat, the application of the principle means that the application of the rules of natural justice is extended to cases where the affected party has no rights, no vested right, but does have a potential right or legitimate expectation. In other words, the rules of fair procedure are extended to those where no case, where no vested right exists, but only a legitimate expectation of a benefit that may be granted or a benefit that will not with be withdrawn before a hearing has occurred. Repeat, in other words, the rules of fair procedure are extended to those cases where no vested right exists, but only a legitimate expectation of a benefit that may be granted or a benefit that will not be withdrawn before a hearing has occurred. The first South African case in which the doctrine of legitimate expectation was raised was Everett versus Minister of the Interior. ADL 2601, page 141 of the study guide. The first South African case in which the doctrine of legitimate expectation was raised was Everett versus Minister of the Interior. The court found that a person who has acquired a temporary residence permit cannot expect to remain in the country for longer than the stipulated period. However, if he is granted entry and residence for a specific period and he is encouraged or he is instructed to leave the country before the expiry of that period, he or she has acquired the right consisting of a legitimate expectation of being allowed to stay for a permitted time. So this was raised in Everett versus Minister of the Interior. In Administrator Transvaal versus Traub, T-R-A-U-B, the case of our scenario. Full recognition was given by the appeal court to the doctrine of legitimate expectation. Full recognition was given by the appeal court to the doctrine of legitimate expectation. The issue before the court was 
was whether the rules of natural justice or the Audi principle rule, as the court called it, is confined to cases where the decision affects the liberty, property or existing rights of the individual concerned. Repeat, the issue before the court was whether the rules of natural justice is confined to cases where the decision affects the liberty, property or existing rights of the individual concerned or whether the impact is wider than this. Judge Corbett found that the Doctors had legitimate expectations since their applications for the posts of senior house officers had been recommended by the departmental heads. That the appointment by the provincial authority would follow as a matter of course upon the recommendations of the heads of department. If the authority intended some change, it the provincial authority should have given a fair hearing to each of the respondents before it, the authority, took its decision. Repeat, if the authority intended some change, the provincial authority should have given a fair hearing to each of the respondents before the authority took its decision. The Chief Justice, quoting Lord Fraser, in the English decision of Council of Civil Unions versus Minister for the Civil Service, held that such a legitimate expectation could arise at least either from an express promise given by the authoritative body or from a regular practice which the claimant of legitimate expectation reasonably expects to continue. Repeat, the Chief Justice, quoting Lord Fraser in the English decision of Council of Civil Unions versus Minister of the Civil Service, held that such a legitimate expectation could result or arise at least either from an express promise given by the authority or authoritative body. Repeat, that a legitimate expectation could arise either from an express promise given by the authoritative body, which is the public authority, or from a regular practice which the claimant which the claimant of a legitimate expectation reasonably expects to continue. You must remember that a legitimate expectation gives you a right to a hearing, but not necessarily to succeed in the application. Repeat, you must remember that a legitimate expectation gives you a right to a hearing, but not necessarily to succeed in the application, which is to get what you want. You must remember that a legitimate expectation gives you a right to a hearing. For example, in Lowry Fraser's case, see above, legitimate expectation gave him a right to be heard but not necessarily to veto the adoption of the child, but not necessarily to veto the adoption of the child. Legitimate expectation doesn't mean you will win your case. Legitimate expectation doesn't mean that you will win your case. Decisions dealing with legitimate expectation After 1994, the concept of legitimate expectation has been at issue 
Decisions dealing with legitimate expectations after 1994. The concept of legitimate expectation has been at issue in a number of cases since 1994. Repeat, the, the concept of legitimate expectation has been at issue in a number of cases since 1994. A reference to the following two will suffice. The concept of legitimate expectation has been at issue in a number of cases since 1994. In Claude Neon versus City Council of Germiston, the facts were the same as in Scenario 4 of the guide. The court found that the applicant had a legitimate expectation that he would be notified. The council's conduct thus amounted to failure of administrative justice within the meaning of section 24 of the interim constitution. Repeat. The court found that the applicant had a legitimate expectation that he would be notified when the tendered documents were ready. The council's conduct thus amounted to a failure of administrative justice within the meaning of section 24 of the interim constitution. This failure justified the setting aside of the contract which had been awarded to a third party and the court ordered the local authority to call for fresh tenders. Repeat, this failure justified the setting aside of the contract which had been awarded to a third party and the court ordered the the local authority to call for fresh tenders. In Jenkins versus Government of the Republic of South Africa. In Jenkins versus Government of the Republic of South Africa. 1996. The conditions of service of the applicant, a public servant, allowed her to use an official vehicle and free housing. The conditions of service of the applicant, a public servant allowed her to use an official vehicle and free housing. After she had made use of the benefits for a period of 18 months, they were summarily withdrawn. The court held that in these circumstances, she had a Legitimate expectation. In Jenkins versus Government of the Republic of South Africa, the conditions of service of the applicant, a public servant, allowed her to use an official vehicle and free housing. After she had made use of the benefits of, for a period of 18 months, they were summarily withdrawn. The court held that in these circumstances, she had a legitimate expectation that she would be given a hearing before any decision was taken to withdraw the benefits. The court stated that the doctrine of legitimate expectation had become part of our law. This means that the doctrine will continue to exist and apply to situations in which the application of procedural fairness is an issue. The court found that legitimate expectations include expectations which go beyond enforceable rights, provided they have some reasonable basis at 76. Repeat, the court found that legitimate expectations have some reasonable basis. The court accepted that a person 
would have a legitimate expectation under circumstances of the particular case. The court found that the applicant had established a legitimate expectation that he would be permitted to apply to regularize his residence and that the application would be favorably considered or at the very least his application would be considered. Repeat. The court accepted that a person would would have a legitimate expectation under the circumstances of the particular case. The court found that the applicant had established a legitimate expectation that he would be permitted to regularize his residence and that the application would be favorably considered or at the very least the application would be considered. Leave me the fuck alone or I'll hurt you. This does not look like studying. Right. The court also examined whether an alien could be treated differently from a South African citizen and came to the following conclusion at 79. Every individual who comes before the courts in this country, whether high or low, rich, poor, alien or local, is entitled to enjoy the benefits flowing from the supremacy of the Constitution, especially where state functionaries perform administrative functions which affect his or her rights, interests or legitimate expectations. Section 3 of the PAJA. Section 3 of the PAJA. This is on page 143 of the study guide. Section 3-2-A. The PAJA specifically states that a fair administrative procedure depends on the circumstances of each case. Specifically states that a fair administrative procedure depends on the circumstances of each case. Academics are in agreement and so are the courts that section 3.2a reflects the reality that the content of procedural fairness varies depending on the contexts in which it applies. Academics are in agreement and so are the courts that section 3.2a reflects the reality that the content of procedural fairness varies depending on the contexts in which it is applied. That the content of procedural fairness varies depending on the contexts for which it applies. Chairman Board on Tariffs, Board on Tariffs and Trade versus Brenko. Chairman, Board on Tariffs and Trade versus Brenko. For example, is a case dealing with an investigation conducted by the first appellant? Is a case dealing with an investigation conducted by the first appellant, BTT, into alleged dumping by the respondents upon receiving co- a complaint from another company. Acting upon the investigation and subsequent recommendation by BTT, acting upon the the investigation 
and subsequent recommendations by BTT and in terms of the Board on Tariffs and Trade Act 107-1986, the Minister of Trade and Industry, the second appellant, and the Minister of Finance, the third appellant, imposed anti-dumping duties on the respondents. The respondents challenged the decisions of the three appellants to impose the duties. The respondents challenged the decisions of the three appellants to impose the duties. They argued that those decisions were taken in a procedurally unfair manner. In his judgment, Judge Zulman held as point of departure that the recommendations of Audi. In his judgment, Judge Zulman held as a point of departure that the requirements of Audi are contextual and relative. In Masetla versus President of the Republic of South Africa, Judge Nkobo noted that the very essence of the requirement to act fairly is its flexibility and practicability. The very essence of the requirement to act fairly is its flexibility and practicability. This case dealt with the former head of the NPA, the NIA, Mr. Billy Masetla, contesting his dismissal. Judge Nkobo noted that the very essence of the requirement to act fairly is its flexibility and practicability. Section 3.2b, uh, the preemptory slash mandatory or minimum call requirements for procedural fairness. The preemptory slash mandatory minimum core requirements for procedural fairness. This subsection reads, in order to give effect to the right to procedurally fair administrative action, an administrator subject to subsection 4 must give a person referred to in subsection 1 I adequate knowledge, adequate notice of the nature and purpose of the proposed administrative action. Adequate notice of the nature and purpose of the proposed administrative action. Adequate notice of the nature and purpose of the proposed administrative action. A reasonable opportunity to make representations. A reasonable opportunity to make representations. A reasonable opportunity to make representations. A clear statement of the administrative action. A clear statement of the administrative action. Remember this is in order to give effect to the right to procedurally fair administrative action. An administrator subject to the subsection 4 must give a person, repeat, in order to give effect to the, light, to the right to procedurally fair administrative action.
in order to give effect to the right to procedurally fair administrative action. Adequate notice of any right of review or internal appeal where applicable. Adequate notice of any right of review or internal appeal. Where applicable. Adequate notice of the right to request reasons in terms of section 5. Repeat adequate notice of the right to request reasons in terms of section 5. Please note the paragraphs were renumbered by section 46 of the Judicial Matters Amendment Act. When one reads Subsection 2b, it appears at first as if the section is, subsection is a codification of the common law principles of natural justice, in that in order to give effect to the right to procedurally fair administrative action, the administrator must, this is a mandatory provision, give the affected person referred to in subsection 1. A. Adequate notice of the nature and purpose of the proposed administrative action. Repeat. Adequate notice of the nature and purpose of the proposed administrative action. B. Reasonable opportunity to make representations. C. A clear statement of the administrative action. D. Adequate notice of any right of review or internal appeal. Adequate notice of any right of review and internal appeal. And lastly, adequate notice of the right to request reasons in terms of section 5. To repeat, adequate notice of the nature and purpose of the proposed administrative action. Repeat, when one reads subsection 2b, it appears at first, as if this subsection is a codification of the common law principles of natural justice, in that in order to give effect to the right to procedurally fair administrative action, the administrator must, this is a mandatory provision, give the affected person referred to in subsection 1, a adequate Notice, adequate notice of the nature of the purpose of the proposed administrative action. B. Reasonable opportunity to make representations. C. A clear statement of the administrative action. D. Administ uh, ad Adequate notice of any right of review or internal appeal. And E. Adequate notice of the right to request reasons in terms of section 5. Repeat. Adequate notice of the right to request reasons. In terms of section 5. Bear in mind as well. What was decided. In Van Heistian. N.O. Versus. Minister of Environmental Affairs and Tourism. That the right to procedurally fair administrative action. Must be given a generous interpretation. Repeat. 
Bear in mind as well what was decided in Van Hastien versus Minister of Environmental Affairs and Tourism. That the right to procedurally fair administrative action must be given a general, a generous interpretation. The purpose of this generous interpretation is to include any situations not covered by the Act. Nevertheless, it is important to remember that the aim of the mandatory elements is to provide the affected person with adequate notice and a reason and, and a reasonable opportunity to make representations before a decision is made or taken. ADL 2601, page 144 of the summary. Nevertheless, it is important to remember that the aim of the mandatory elements is to provide the affected person with adequate notice and a reasonable opportunity to make representations before a decision is taken. Note further that the use of the words adequate and reasonable leave the administrator with some flexibility to decide on the precise content of the notice and the opportunity given to make representations. At the very least, though, affected persons must be provided with sufficient information in order for them to know the case they have to make the, to know the case they have to meet so that their opportunity to make representations is a meaningful one. See for example Earth Life Africa versus Director General the Department of Environmental Affairs and Tourism which is reproduced in the guide in Annex B. The case deals with the intended construction of a pebble bed modular reactor at Kuburg in Cape Town and the applicant's challenge of the decision to authorize the construction. Repeat, Earth Life Africa versus Director General Department of Environmental Affairs and Tourism which is reproduced in the guide in Annex B. The case deals with the intended construction of a pebble bed modular reactor at Kubik, Cape Town and the applicant's challenge of the decision to authorize the construction. The court per Grisel, Judge Grisel said that what is required in order to give effect to the right to a fair hearing is that the interested party must be placed in a position to present and controvert in a meaningful way. In order to do so, the aggrieved party should know the gist or substance of the case that has to that it has to meet. The third requirement that a clear statement of the administrative action must be given to the affected person relates to in all probability to the administrative action that has already been taken. Repeat the third requirement that a clear statement of the administrative action must be given to the affected person relates in all probability to administrative action that already has taken been taken. In other words, after a course of action has been decided on, the third requirement that a clear statement of the administrative action a clear statement of the administrative action must 
must be given to the affected person relates in all probability to the administrative action that has or that already has been taken. In other words, after a course of action has to be decided on, the affected person should at least be able to tell the de- from the statement what has been decided, when, by whom, and on what legal and factual basis. Repeat. The affected person should at least be able to tell from the statement what has been decided, when, by whom, and on what legal and factual basis. The fourth and fifth mandatory elements, namely that of adequate notice of any right of review or internal appeal, an adequate notice of the right to request reasons in terms of section 5. The fourth and fifth mandatory elements, fuck's sake, oops, the fourth and fifth mandatory elements, namely that of adequate notice of any right of review or internal appeal, An adequate notice of the right to request reasons in terms of section 5 are discussed in greater detail in study units 11 and 12. The fourth and fifth mandatory elements, namely that of adequate notice of any right of review or internal appeal. The discretionary requirements for procedural fairness. The discretionary requirements for procedural fairness. Section 3.3. The discretionary requirements for procedural fairness. Section 3.3. The discretionary requirements for procedural fairness. Subsection 3 of Section 3 reads as follows. In order to give effect to the right to procedurally fair administrative action, an administrator may, in his or her discretion, give also give a person referred to in Subsection 1 an opportunity to obtain assistance and in serious or complex cases, legal representation. Repeat. Subsection 3. In order to give effect to the right procedurally fair administrative action. In order to give effect to the right proceed, to give effect to the right to procedurally Fair administrative action. An administrator may, in his or her or its discretion, also give a person referred to in subsection one an op- a an opportunity to obtain assistance and, in serious or complex cases. Legal representation. B. Present and dispute information and arguments. And C. Appear in person. It is important that we take particular note of the fact that the administrator has a discretionary power under subsection 3 regarding certain issues pertaining to fair procedure. An administrator may give a person whose rights or legitimate expectations have been materially or adversely affected.
an opportunity to a obtain assistance and legal representation in serious or complex cases repeat obtain assistance and legal representation in serious or complex cases b present and dispute information and arguments present and dispute information and arguments and c personal appearance personal appearance that means at common law personal appearance was not a requirement unless the empowering statute made provision made express provision for this repeat at common law personal appearance was not a requirement